Guy Stevens is mostly remembered as the man who produced London Calling by The Clash, or as the crazy manager and producer of Mott the Hoople. But Guy Stevens also played a major role in shaping Britain's music scene in the 60s. His work with The Clash and Mott the Hoople has been thoroughly discussed in documentaries and books over the years. So, this video will be focused on his early days in the music business and his major influence in the 60s. Most British kids who were in their late teens in the early 60s got into music in the mid-50s when they heard artists such as Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, or Little Richard among many others. However, by the late 50s and early 60s, the music industry started ignoring most of these artists in favor of teen idols who mostly played bland pop ballads for teeny boppers. At that point, those who missed the grit and raw nature of those 50s songs started to look for music somewhere else. And they found that grit and raw sound in American rhythm and blues records. However, these American records were virtually impossible to get in Britain. So those British kids who wanted to get those records, had to get them as imports from America. That's how Guy Stevens and many other young kids in Britain, built their record collection. By 1962, Stevens already had the best and most extensive collection of rhythm and blues records in the UK. At the time, R&B only had a minority appeal among British kids. But this changed around late 1962 and early 1963 when a virtually unknown band called the Rolling Stones started playing clubs in London. Almost overnight, the Stones were able to build a huge following of kids who packed every club they played, and they didn't even have a record deal yet. This was the beginning of the so-called Britain's rhythm and blues boom of the early 60s. This new movement was a big deal at the time, with many journalists even claiming that it could be a serious threat to the Beatles and the whole Merseybeat scene. While it certainly didn't affect the Beatles' career, it did eventually kill Merseybeat. When a television channel from Germany visited Liverpool in 1964 to film a documentary about the influence that the Beatles had on the music scene, they were surprised to find that most of the groups playing at the Cavern and other clubs were groups who looked and sounded like the Stones. Several rhythm and blues clubs sprung up all over the UK. One of the best was the Scene Club in Soho. The club opened its doors in March 1963, and it was run by Irish businessman Ronan O'Rahilly, who also created offshore pirate station Radio Caroline. My name is Ronan O'Rahilly. Guy Stevens, who had just turned 20 years old, started a weekly R&B disc night at the club. These DJ sessions took place every Monday night and Stevens would play obscure records by Stax Chess and Motown that nobody had ever heard before in Britain. These sessions attracted a growing number of mods and musicians, including members of the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Yardbirds, the Who, and the Small Faces among many others. In an interview from the early 2000s, Guy's wife Diane Cox remembered. The scene club was mainly a mod thing. It was a hangover from the weekend because it was on a Monday night. I don't know whether they were still high on amphetamines, but the whole thing then was that you worked all week, then bought some pills, stayed out, went to the Flamingo Club, and if you were still going on a Monday, you went to the scene. Guy never took pills, that didn't start until quite a long time later. He was very conventional then, going to football matches on a Saturday, he was a complete football fanatic, an Arsenal supporter, him and his brother. The scene club enjoyed enormous popularity, and even American publications such as Time magazine would write about the club. Readers of British music papers would also send letters to publications such as Record Mirror praising the virtues of the club. Despite the so-called rhythm and blues revival, my friends and I still have great difficulty in hearing or getting played our favorite type of music outside of our own homes. DJs constantly ignore some great R&B discs that are issued thus preventing the general public from catching on to this kind of music. It seems to me that the only place where rhythm and blues are not regarded as dirty words are in the pages of Record Mirror and at London Scene Club on Monday nights, where I must confess I never expected to hear such an amount of my kind of music played at once. DJ Guy Stevens has in my opinion the finest collection of R&B I've ever heard, and he doesn't mind playing it. The fact that the place is getting more and more popular each week proves that there is a demand for this kind of music. So come on Radio Luxembourg and BBC DJs. Let's hear more of the real thing. In an interview several years later, Pete Townsend said, the scene club was really where it was at. It was a focal point for the mod movement. 
I don't think anyone who was a mod outside Soho, realized that all the fashions and dances began there. In fact, at the time, many musicians who weren't from London, hadn't even heard of the mod subculture. In an interview from the early 2000s, Original Animals drummer John Steele remembered. And, uh, we couldn't really understand it at this time because we were just a bunch of northern rockers, you know. The fact is, we'd never even heard of, we didn't know what a mod was until right. we arrived uh, at the Steam Club in Ham Yard because it was purely a, a London phenomenon at that time. And, um, and all of them took um, loads and loads of Purple Heart. The Animals were one of many bands from that era who had songs supplied by Guy Stevens. At the time, most bands still relied on covers, and Stevens would supply songs for many groups, charging a fiver for compilation tapes. Some of those R&B covers on those early records by the Beatles and the Stones were supplied by him, and he also supplied songs for other bands such as the Yardbirds, the Small Faces, the Spencer Davis Group, and the Who. All those bands would regularly visit Guy Stevens' house in Regent's Park to keep up to date with new releases. In an interview from 1979, Stevens said, The Who came to my house with their manager Kit Lambert. Kit offered me a fiver to make a two-hour tape for them because Townsend hadn't started writing, and they had no material to play on stage. So I played them all James Brown stuff, and I played them Rumble by Link Ray and put it on the tape for them. By then, I'd built up this enormous collection, and Steve Marriott and everybody used to come round to get material. The demand for rhythm and blues was such that some British labels started issuing several American records. In 1963, Guy Stevens was hired to choose all the releases featured on the R&B series by Pi Records, which licensed recordings from Chess and Checker Records in Chicago. Stevens oversaw the re-release campaign that marked the first time that Berry and Diddley, along with other blues giants, had seen coordinated release in the UK. All those records weren't even mastered from the original master tapes, they were all mastered from his own record collection. Stevens was also hired by Record Mirror magazine to write profiles on artists such as Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Chuck Berry, and many others. Nowadays, these are all household names. But at the time, many of these artists were still virtually unknown to most British kids. Record Mirror's editor Norman Jopling claimed that he had never met anyone with that kind of enthusiasm and passion for music. Stevens was also the president of the Chuck Berry Appreciation Society, and such was his commitment that he arranged Chuck's bail to spring him from jail for his debut UK tour. In the early 60s, Berry's popularity had faded considerably in the States. So when Guy Stevens told him about the popularity of his music in Britain, Chuck Berry thought he was joking. In 1964, Stevens was approached by record company executive Chris Blackwell to run the Sioux record label in the UK as an offshoot of Island Records. Island Records was an independent label that was founded by Blackwell in Jamaica in 1959, before relocating to England in 1962. Initially, Island mostly dealt with recordings by Jamaican artists. At the time, Blue Beat was quite big in several clubs in Britain, and Island was the go-to label for that kind of material. The label's first hit was My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. The label started expanding their horizons in 1964 when they signed the Spencer Davis Group, whose repertoire was supplied by Stevens. That same year, the label landed a deal to issue recordings by the American Sioux label in Britain. The British Sioux label eventually also started issuing recordings from other labels such as Stax or Chess. By mid-1965, Sue had already issued 100 singles and several LPs. Beat Instrumental magazine wrote a very interesting article about the label to celebrate its 100th single. Journalist John Emery wrote, Have you ever wondered how the group appearing at your local club or ballroom ever got hold of some of those obscure items they announce on stage with such relish? The main source of inspiration to our soul-searching instrumentalists is undoubtedly a little label called Sue a respected name among our deeper groups, and whose new releases are regularly the talking point between them when they get the opportunity to get together on a night off. Sue is very near to releasing its 100th single, besides, of course, a countless number of albums. But they are still without a hit. The nearest it has come to the charts was Hurt by Love by Charlie and Inez Fox, which made number 38. You
George Harrison is on the mailing list, insisting he receives every single and long player that's issued, and likewise the Spencer Davis Group, whose act is now virtually a catalogue of Sioux numbers adapted to their own style and arrangement. Guy Stevens, the man who with Chris Blackwell evolved the idea for the label back in 1963, feels there are several reasons. Guy Stevens said, first, the coloured artist has not really been accepted in this country, and virtually all our artists are black. Consequently, we get very few plays and little exposure except by hit record producers and in the London clubs, where they go down a bomb because of the profound dancing beat featured on most of them. Yet what is not good enough for the average record buyer is good enough for groups like the Rolling Stones and The Who. Guy Stevens commented, they both visit my house in Regent's Park to keep up to date on our new releases. Once upon a time, I used to take a batch of Sue releases to the Stones recording sessions. The Who are keen fans, and used one of our numbers, Daddy Rolling Stone by Derek Martin, as a flip side after taping it when they came round one night. The Scene Club eventually closed its doors in 1966 due to several drug raids and constant police harassment. But at that point, Stevens had already broken into record production and he was also appointed A&R man at Island Records. Stevens started by signing a band called the VIPs, who'd later morph into Spooky Tooth. The VIPs changed their name to Art and released an excellent psychedelic album called Supernatural Fairy Tales. Guy Stevens obviously still loved R&B, but he was also fascinated by the new psychedelic music and culture that was blooming in Britain. That same year, Guy Stevens also managed and produced Hapshash and the Coloured Coat, an artistic and musical collaboration between the band Art and designers Michael English and Nigel Weymouth. English and Weymouth were well known for designing the posters that were used to promote shows at the UFO Club, the legendary psychedelic club that witnessed the rise of bands such as Pink Floyd, Soft Machine and Tomorrow. This unusual collaboration led to one of the most bizarre psychedelic albums released in Britain in 1967. The album went pretty much unnoticed at the time, but it has acquired a cult status over the years and it was actually quite ahead of its time. The record predated the sort of stuff that Krautrock bands started doing in the early 70s by at least three years. Guy Stevens was also crucial in the formation of Procol Harum. In 1967, he met lyricist Keith Reed and introduced him to future Procol Harum leader Gary Brooker, encouraging them to start working together. Stevens had been a friend of Gary Brooker and Robin Trower since the early to mid-60s, when both were members of a band called The Paramounts, one of many bands from that era whose live repertoire was supplied by Stevens. After a wild night partying in London, lyricist Keith Reed overheard Guy Stevens saying that someone at the party had turned a whiter shade of pale. This inspired Keith Reed and Gary Brooker to start working on their first song. Guy Stevens heard it and was blown away, and he suggested that they named the band after his cat, who was called Procol Harum. Stevens was determined to sign the band to Island Records. However, Chris Blackwell wasn't impressed by the song, and decided not to sign them. Procol Harum signed to Derham instead, and the song became one of the most commercially successful singles in history, having sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. The song is still the most played record by British broadcasting of the past 70 years. Obviously, one of the worst mistakes in Chris Blackwell's career. However, Guy Stevens wasn't around to witness the success of the song. Stevens was imprisoned for several months for drug offences while the song was climbing up the charts. And it got worse when he got out of prison and found out that his entire record collection had been stolen from his mother's house. This led to a breakdown and a period of severe depression. After a while, however, he returned to Island Records and produced the debut albums by bands such as Free, Black Knight, that's up your heart. Mighty Baby, no and Heavy Jelly. Guy Stevens was fascinated by the double keyboard attack of bands such as Procol Harum or Spooky Tooth. He felt that bands featuring both piano and organ were the future. And his dream was to find a band with that lineup and who sounded like a mix between Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones. 
and he found that dream band in Mott the Hoople. However, as previously stated in the beginning of the video, his association with Mott and later The Clash has already been thoroughly documented in several books and documentaries. This video wanted to provide an overview on his crucial role as an influencer in the 60s, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching the video and see you next time.